Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the CAP NCR webinar sponsored by the Tertiary Committee in partnership with Rex Bookstore. Our webinar has for its theme CAP NCR Tertiary Schools geared towards a holistic approach to preparing for the new normal. We thank all of you for being with us today. The theme I have mentioned tertiary schools, but we also have in this room our co-educators from the elementary and high school levels. This is because we believe that regardless of levels, educators and educational institutions face the same challenges in school year 2020-2021. Yesterday, we focused on instructional delivery, where we learned from Dr. Edison Fermin, meaning making in flexible learning, what matters, what works and on student support with Mr. Kevin Conrad Danshonko on maximizing library resources in support of instruction. Today, our focus will be on student wellness and on the student's spiritual formation while learning under the new normal environment. So to start our activity right, may I call on Dr. Erlinda Asierto the Vice President for Academic Research and College Dean of the Asian Social Institute to lead the opening prayer. I believe uh, Dr. Linda has no audio. Okay. So uh, we will have the prayer again um, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us spend moments of silence as we breathe in deeply and exhale slowly. Let our breathing be our prayer. We praise and thank our God of life and love for listening unfailingly to our prayers. You have been our anchor in the midst of this pandemic and you have constantly provided us with our needs and the hope to get through every day. We are glad that we are able to make it today. Heavenly Father be with us in this webinar. Send your Holy Spirit to inspire us as we listen to our resource speakers who will help and guide us as we seek for the most appropriate way or approach to ensure the best in, educator, in educating our learning partners, the administrators, the teachers, staff, students, and community partners. For all said and unsaid prayers, we unite them in the prayer of your Son, our Lord Jesus. Our Father in heaven, Holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, give us day, this day our daily, our daily bread, bread. bread. Forgive, uh, us forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we as forgive, forgive those, those who trespass against, against, against us. Do not Lead us not to the test, but deliver, deliver us from evil. evil. Amen. Amen. We also ask the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is, the with, Lord you. is with you. Blessed, are, blessed you are you among women, women. And, and blessed, blessed is, the is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, 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 Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So before we proceed, let us be reminded first of our few house rules. So please keep your audio on mute and your video turned off. 
We encourage everyone to finish each presentation before posting any question. There will be time allotted for question and answer at the latter, latter part of each presentation. You may click the Q&A button found at the participant section of the app if you wish to raise a question. Make sure to indicate your school affiliation. Kindly limit your question to one to give way to the questions of other participants. So there. So it looks like we are ready at this juncture. We, should, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the members of the Board of Trustees of CAPNCR, headed by Father Nolan Kwe, the reg Regional Trustee, with the members, Sister, Mary, Sister M. Christine L. Pinto, OSB, the Vice Regional Trustee, Reverend Father Emilio A. Ascaño, LRMS, the Treasurer, Dr. Leo V. Galve, the Secretary, Sister Daisy L. Fornan, OP, Director at Large, and Dr. Ava Ann P. Simurlan, Director at Large. We likewise acknowledge the presence of Attorney Dominador D. Buhain, the Chairman and President of Rex Book of Companies, and Ms. Danda Crimelda Buhain, the Chief External Affairs Officer of Rex Book of Companies. So thank you very much, Father Nolan Kwe, the members of the Board of Trustees of CAPNCR, Attorney Dominador Buhain and Ms. Danda Buhain of Rex Bookstore or Rex Book of Companies for being with us today and for your support to this undertaking. To welcome us all for today, let us have Attorney Dominador Buhain, Chairman or President of Rex Book of Companies for his welcome message. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pornes. Greetings on the second day of the CEAP NCR Tertiary School geared towards a holistic approach during a new normal. Allow me to reiterate what, what I mentioned yesterday. I hope you are all safe and well amidst these trying times. Before we begin today's very important discussion on the new normal of private higher education, I would like to thank each and everyone for making time to be with the Rex family today. We may be separated physically by this pandemic, but webinars such as this prove that we are more than ever united and together in our passion for education and the Filipino learner. Every day, the death toll continues to rise. News of our fellow countrymen losing their jobs. Government and health sector helplessly watch as the resources are stretched and strained to the limits. In the private higher education sector, issues of sustainability and relevance have arisen, putting at risk the learning experience of hundreds of thousands of students. The needs of your students, of our students and their families have now changed as the educational system is being pressured to respond to repercussions of this pandemic, both anticipated and unforeseen. But this is why I would like to commend every one of you today, because today, instead of accepting defeat, we are challenging ourselves, tapping into our inner reservoir of creativity and resourcefulness. To overcome this great depression, Instead of focusing on the negative, we are looking at the horizon, eager to unearth the opportunities that are waiting for us. We have started the discussion for this very reason, to invoke discourses and provide a healthy, safe, and engaging platform for all the members of the education sector. Together, we will turn this disruption into a moment of creation of something new, something better 
for our education system, for ourselves, and for the learners that we serve. This is why it is an honor and with deepest pride to be welcoming all of you today to this session. Just by being here, by being willing to take part in this revolutionary spirit in our history, you are doing your country a great and honorable service. And with the blessing of our Lord Almighty, may we be filled with wisdom and strength to deliver what we endeavor to do. Para sa bata, para sa bawat mamamayan, para sa bayan. Thank you, and again, good morning. Thank you very much, Attorney Buhain. Yes, um, we are also very grateful for being for for um, you, Rex, um, Book of Companies, to be our partner in this activity. And we are all um, indeed facing this challenge, or all the challenges um, brought about by this pandemic, proactively. Uh, so, para sa bayan, para sa mamamayan. I'm sorry, para sa bata, para sa mamamayan. Para sa bayan. Thank wow. you very much once again, uh, Attorney Buhain. So at this point, uh, we now call on the father of CAP NCR, Father Nolan Kue, the regional trustee, for his opening remarks. Good morning to my fellow educators. Have you heard recently the pronouncement of World Health Organization? on the possibility that COVID-19 is airborne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it has disturbed me a lot, you know. And I look forward that we keep on praying. Very timely, in the gospel reading for today, Jesus summoned the twelve and gave them authority. And what does authority mean? It is inviting us all to respond to the call to become disciples of Jesus. To be a disciple means that there is an eagerness to know, there is an eagerness to love, and there is an eagerness as well to serve Jesus. And this loving, knowing, and serving Jesus continuously to take place in our working environment, and that is our own Catholic schools. And this is the reason why we are here. Because we wanted that a lot of people, young people, will be able to know, to love, and to serve the Lord. Every day, we have our prayer session in all our schools. And I have requested all of them to post pictures of our praying prayer sessions. Well, the posting of picture would remind everyone and hopefully it will become a venue to evangelize everyone that indeed we should know, love, and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. May our webinar today truly make us all an authentic disciple as we make the proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Always remember that Catholic education is both a gift and a mission. And final reminder to all attendees, no? let us use the word new normal properly. On my part, I don't consider things that we're doing now as new normal. I'm looking forward that when everything simmers down, then we start discovering the new normal, new ways of doing things but with a renewed passion and commitment as Catholic educators, as we do our mission to the young people of this generation. Let us all give our best, give our ears, our minds, and most importantly, our heart to this webinar. May the Lord bless our simple steps, our small efforts, as we do respond to his mission to become his disciples. God morning to everyone. Good morning also, uh, Father Nolan. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for. Um, 
as a reminder given to us, a reminder given to us by Father Nolan, let us all be disciples, authentic disciples at that, um, so that we will be able to, to serve, love uh, Christ through our students, through uh, the people we are meeting. And uh, well noted, Father, that we will be using the new normal correctly and uh, give our best in everything that we do so that we will be really authentic disciples of Christ. So thank you once again, uh, Father Nolan Kwe. And uh, so let us start learning from our speakers. And so I call on Ms. Maridel Negradas, Tertiary Committee Secretary and Head of Planning and Quality Assurance and Chair of the Computer Science and Information Technology Programs of St. Paul University, Manila, to introduce our first speaker. Ms. Negradas, please. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Virgie. Our speaker, Dr. Maria Victoria Trinidad, holds a PhD in Counseling Psychology, a Master's in Guidance in Counseling, and a Bachelor's Degree in Psychology from De La Salle University, Manila. She is an Associate Professor of St. Scholastica's College, Manila, where she currently serves as the Dean of Graduate School, Chair of the Psychology and Counseling for both graduate and undergraduate programs, and the Operations Manager and Volunteer Psychologist at the Haven, of Optimum, Haven for Optimum Psycho-Spiritual Empowerment, or HOPE, Community Counseling Center, a nonprofit extension program of St. Scholastica's College Graduate School. As a practicing psychologist, she specializes in psychological assessment and counseling in psychotherapeutic interventions for adolescents and adults with special needs brought about by difficult life circumstances such as domestic violence, substance abuse, depression and suicide, and other clinical and personality disorders. She has been actively involved in the design and treatment programs, conducted training on adolescent and youth and development for health and non-health service providers, and served as a consulting psychologist for the Department of Education, School Health and Nutrition Center from 2001, and from 2001 to 2011. Dr. Trinidad is an active member of various professional organizations such as the Psychological Association of the Philippines, Philippine Guidance and Counseling Association Incorporated, and Philippine Association for Counselor Education, Research and Supervision, where she was a member of the Board of Directors from 2002 to 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker, Dr. Maria Victoria Trinidad. Uh, thank you, Ms. Maridel, for the kind introduction. I would also like to thank SEAP and CR and Rex Group of Companies for the opportunity to be part of your webinar series for the new normal. So my topic is uh, safeguarding the mental wellness of students under the new normal. So for the next 30 minutes, I will be discussing mental health as an emerging crisis impact of COVID-19 pandemic on young children and adolescents, parents, teachers, and school as learning partners and how they can help safeguard the mental health of students under the new normal. Because of the pandemic, schools have been closed for many weeks now and teaching is moving online. So the idea is for our students to continue their education at home. Now, in order to help our students, it's important to understand the developmental stage of our students. The stage of adolescence is already an incredibly vulnerable and challenging period in life. They are in the stage where they're just becoming aware of the world outside of the world, still developing their identities, and are now arguing in their minds many existential questions that the life during the pandemic may greatly influence. Parents now are struggling to help cope, uh, to help their children cope with the stress and anxiety brought about by this pandemic. Mental health is an emerging crisis. So what we are experiencing now will have its implication on mental health. 
The coronavirus pandemic has been followed by a concern by us mental health professionals for a potential rise in depression, anxiety, suicide, including homicide, exacerbated by social isolation due to quarantine and social distancing measures, fears about contracting the virus, unemployment, and financial factors. So all of us have been greatly affected by the pandemic and it has brought to us high levels of uncertainty, especially at the beginning, information overload about the virus and our real situation, economic downturn, and finance, global financial crisis. It has also affected our life substantially. Uh, many companies have closed down and employees were either laid off or retrenched. And of course, also the financial crisis is felt by all of us. And then it has brought about major disruptions to our work and personal life. Many of us are now working at home and we either had to, uh, we had to either cancel or postpone many of the activities that we planned for the rest of the school year. So in addition, SWS latest survey showed Filipinos uh, perceive their life as miserable and difficult during the past 12 months. In addition, more than 50% of Filipinos now anticipate that the, that, that the worst is yet to come. Ra there was a rise in teenage pregnancy, particularly in the Visayas region. This is second to the highest in Southeast Asia, which means that around 538 babies are born to Filipino teenagers every single day. Online sexual abuse was also up by 20% during the quarantine period. So it is completely normal that many of us continue to experience uncertainty, worry, and stress. The pandemic has been devastating for us adults, but the impact on adolescents is far greater or worse. That is because many psychiatric conditions usually manifest during adolescence. This pandemic has substantially affected them, interrupted their uh, education, early work experiences, and activities that may influence their future careers. So how is the pandemic affecting adolescents? Adolescents are more sensitive to lockdown orders and social distancing. Unlike younger children, younger children tend to cling to their parents and now feel safer that they are with their parents. Adolescents are naturally, biologically, and emotionally driven to gravitate away from their families and seek comfort and reassurance from their peers and their friends. So right now, they are missing their friends and not being able to see them face to face is bringing them a lot of anxiety and stress. So this is short of saying this is the worst time to become a teenager because of what's happening around us. Um, adolescent stage is the time where they are when they are supposed to build and maintain relationships outside of their family. It is one of the hallmarks of being a teenager. So what can help is that initially parents should have explained to their children about the details of, a, of the pandemic, why they should stay home, that staying home will stop the virus and protect themselves and why also social distancing is necessary. So in the meantime, allow them to virtually connect with their peers through um, video chat, uh, text, and other means. Adolescents are grieving for the loss of traditional milestones and celebrations in their life. So we have become once adolescents ourselves and we usually look forward to many fun and meaningful activities. So they have lost education time. Now they have restricted access to peers. They have lost daily structure in their life. No graduation, no sports, no mm -hmm. other activities. So it's helpful if we will listen to their concerns, do not trivialize their stressors, allow them to grieve over what they are experiencing and not experiencing. This pandemic may worsen existing mental health problems of adolescents and thereby lead to more cases. At the start of the pandemic, this was uh, personally my concern as a psychologist and second parents of our students. 
I was concerned about our students with existing mental health concerns because of the long lockdown, they were unable to continue seeing their psychologists and psychiatrists, and as well as take their medications. Um, so at the start of the semester, I, I communicated with our students, check up on how they are. And I was relieved also that our school guidance counselors, even at the start of the pandemic, continued to communicate with our students. So what can help uh, is for us to continue to provide them access to online mental health counseling and referral. The pandemic is a risky time for risky behaviors. Teenagers are now online most of the time. And now that the learning has been moved online, they may have more unscheduled time in their hands and this will leave them likely to experiment with risky behaviors. So they can be a victim of sexual exploitation and cyber grooming. Um, strangers may invite them to send their pictures or videos with sexual content. And they may be uh, also a uh, subject of mean comments. They may be bullied or themselves bully other adolescents and children. So what can help is that parents can speak to their adolescents about online safety. Our guidance counselors can also integrate this in their session with the students to protect themselves. So it's very important for our parents to establish rules on how, when, and where internet can be used. There was also a rise in domestic violence and child maltreatment. Those who were confined in household where there is abuse and interpersonal violence are at higher risk now that families are stuck together. Remember uh, our students with, uh, where there is abuse in the family, they have considered our school campuses, our classroom, as their safe haven. And now they are, they are at home. So it's very important for our guidance counselors and faculty to continue to check or monitor the status of students' physical and mental health. Adolescents are struggling with intense emotions right now. Adolescent stage is, is already characterized by a range of intense emotions. So you can imagine how they feel right now that they are not allowed to go out. So what can help is we need to encourage them to talk about how they feel. We listen to them. We let them know. We let them feel that we understand their present situation and validate their feelings. Uh, as I mentioned, we do not trivialize their stressors. And it's also important for adolescents to engage in activities that will help them channel those especially negative or pent-up emotions, like engaging in, in learning new skills, art, uh, drawing, and journaling. Parents, teachers, and school are considered, uh, I consider as learning partners. So we will uh, discuss the parents first. Parents are, they, they, they play a major role in preparing our students for the new normal, for online classes. Because remember, classes will no longer happen inside the classroom, but at home. Now, what are the challenges of parents during the pandemic? They, they are struggling now to provide for their families during the pandemic, uh, aside from ensuring that their family meet their basic needs. Now they have to make sure that they include educational expenses, not to mention the gadgets and the technology that they, they would, their children would be needing for online learning. They need to also juggle work and childcare responsibilities, as well as how children will adapt to home learning. So not only they, do they need to focus on their own work at home, but they have to make sure that their children who are also studying uh, adapt or adjust to home learning. Home learning. So um, the, 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 for the parents, the struggle is real, you know, but I think it would help if we take advantage of this opportunity, you know, since families are always together at home, to take advantage, to take the opportunity to improve the relationship at home. Um, in the beginning, there will be um, fun and inspiring moments, but there will also be angry and frustrating mo moments as they adjust to the new setup at home. So, Parents need to balance facts with level of reassurance and talk about coming up with plans to help the family in their present situation. 
So parents would need to call their children uh, to have an open and honest discussion about their family situation, not only to reassure them, but come up with plans and involve them in, in the decisions that the family will make. No? This, is, this will increase their sense of safety and well-being if they are included in the plan. So parents need to partner with their children to create the new normal. They need to engage with their children as a learning partner in planning a routine schedule at home. So they need to start with a routine in terms of uh, waking up schedule for their children who will be doing virtual classes, waking up schedule, taking a sh shower, uh, meal time, time when they can do the, uh, they will do their virtual classes and time when they can uh, chat with their friends and for other activities. So it's important for parents to prepare their children you know, when they face their virtual classes to dress up for their classes, not in their pajamas, to make, because that would not motivate them to uh, stay engaged in their classes. Help them organize their study environment at home. So uh, you can, they can select a, a study area if the bedroom is big enough, they can choose an area there, if there's a desk or a table, away from the bed, because if they don't allow them to study on the bed as they will be very relaxed and no longer uh, focus on the, on the lesson. If there's no space in the bedroom, they can find uh, another space in the house where it can be designated as a, study, as a study area. So it's important for family members to know the schedule of each family member time when the parents are working, time when children are studying, so that the other members can cooperate and give them the, the, the silence and, and peace that they need when they're doing their work or studies. They have to agree as a family on boundaries and expectations, and that includes how, when, and where internet can be used. So it's very important that before the start of classes, they already can practice at home, so that they will have a consistent uh, schedule to follow before the start of classes. To minimize conflict with uh, adolescents, parents need to model a calm response and manage their anxieties first. Uh, remember the emotional reaction or response of adolescents is in part a reaction to what they see in their parents or caregivers. So uh, normally, um, anxious parents will have anxious children and depressed parents will have depressed children. So it's important for us, also, for, uh, for parents also, to do self-care. Self-care can be as simple as taking a shower, uh, dressing up, or uh, having a short uh, chat with a friend while uh, taking coffee. So parents, uh, doing self-care is not an option. It's necessary so that you will be fully recharged to carry out your responsibility and to better assist your children uh, during their uh, stay at home. Now, teachers are second, second to the among the learning partners. Now, what is the impact of COVID-19 on, on teachers? Our lives as teachers, I can relate to this as I'm also an educator, our lives have been turned up, upside uh, down because we need to learn new ways of teaching. Now, particularly for, faculty, for older faculty, we have to remember that uh, the level of instruction that we have been doing every day in our classes, we cannot apply them, them now, but we need to learn to come up with, uh, uh, develop new modules for our online classes. So we need to learn new ways of teaching. So it's helpful to tell ourselves, it's okay not to be the perfect online teacher. You have just started and you are doing your best. This can be an opportunity for you to learn new skills. Um, learning something new helps us and protect us from um, memory loss and dementia. So learning something new is going to be challenging and it will have exercise our brain so that we will not come to the point that uh, we will have um, memory loss or dementia. So isipin na lang natin, that will be our benefits, uh, benefit in the long run. Uh, teachers also need to balance work and personal life. So this is the greatest challenge of faculty. Not only do they, they, they need to attend to their own work, but they have to attend, you know, if they have children, 
to the uh, to their children at home. So what can teachers do to help students under the new normal? Emulate as possible the classroom situation. So what we can do is we can start our classes as usual with a prayer, greet our students since we don't know yet, uh, them well yet. And then I, I believe that if we owe it to the students to, to look our best when we face our online classes. So we also have to, to fix ourselves and, and look at our, uh, at our best. And we, it's important that we project passivity and that we are also motivated to do what we are, uh, we are doing because this will be felt by our students. So our, their motivation will be affected if we ourselves are not motivated in what we are doing. Provide an open and supportive learning environment where students can ask questions as what has mentioned about yesterday by uh, Dr. Fermin, the speaker. Um, faculty need to be besties with their students. So we need to uh, establish rapport with them so that they can be motivated to uh, stay engaged during our virtual classes. It will be helpful to start the semester to ask students how they are doing. So do not go uh, right away discussing the lessons, but it would help if you will ask them how they feel about school being canceled for months, thoughts about doing online classes, and how this compares with being physically present in school their feelings about at home instead of being in school, and ways they are managing their stress. In this way, they are sharing with each other um, ways on how they have coped with the pandemic and ways they, continue, they can continue to share with each other uh, strategies that they can adopt, other students can adopt to have focus during their online classes. So students under the new normal, remember, they are struggling to focus, and this lack of focus can lead to lack of motivation and an inability to complete their schoolwork. We need to let our students know that it's natural to lack motivation and focus during this challenging time. The most important is that whether or not we lack motivation, we stay disciplined, we just do our best. No? So uh, let's face it, it's really hard to focus given the, during a pandemic, given the, what is happening around us. So also, let us give reasonable requirements to our students, those that uh, they can achieve, given the situation that we are in now. We need to make learning manageable for our students, give them tools to connect, give them additional resources that they can use, Adjust whatever learning mo mode is available for them. It's better to apply both synchronous and asynchronous delivery of instruction to make sure that even those without internet or weak internet, uh, we can reach them when we do our classes. Create challenging and fun activities to keep our students engaged. This can include energizing exercises, a reward system to give incentives to group activities. Include activities that promote autonomy to keep them motivated. Like for example, we can give them freedom to choose their group mates or decide on a project whether they would like to come up with a book or a poster. Encourage students to work in small groups because this will help them achieve their developmental task of building and maintaining relationships outside of the family. So this will foster relatedness this is for deeper understanding of study materials. It can lower their anxiety and stress. It can help students master collaborative skills also. Then we also need to teach students strategies to deal with this challenging time to strengthen their mental health. We can include well-being days in our classes wherein we don't discuss the lesson, but we, just, we discuss something else. Uh, those things that can, can help them cope uh, with the pandemic. Teach them mindfulness to lower their stress. We can ask them to focus on the present moment rather, rather than worrying about the future. And also they can spend one time deep breathing or visualizing a happy place before starting a lesson to help them relax. So you can remind them that every time they feel stressed, they, they can go back and visualize this happy place to change the way their feelings, uh, the, 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 to, to change their negative feelings. 
Now, as, as faculty, as teachers, we also learn, need to learn to detect signs and symptoms of depression in students. Symptoms, if they talk about harming or killing themselves, they usually would know from their peers or their classmates, or it, they, they might tell you also if they display uh, isolation and withdrawal and they have changes in sleeping, eating, sleeping and eating patterns, either they are not eating or not sleeping or they are oversleeping or overeating. If they display depressed mood, anxiety, irritability, frustration, agitation, or anger. So what can help is we encourage our students to seek professional help if we see these symptoms or refer them to our guidance counselors. So it's very important for faculty also to, do, to engage in self-care. We also have to energize ourselves so that we can uh, assist better our students. So like parents, uh, doing self-care is not an option, it's necessary. So engage in, in healthy living and eating uh, healthy habits. And we also need to set boundaries. No? Sometimes parents assume that we are available 24 hours a day. So I think it's very important to let our parents know our available schedule, where, when they can message us or consult with us, and message us only if there is an emergency at other times. Because you also need to take care of yourself. And then it could help no, if we make space for gratitude in our life, like every morning or at any time of the day, you can list down five things that you are grateful for. Grateful for uh, you are still alive, you still wake, woke up in the morning, you are grateful that you have work, and all those things. Research has shown that uh, doing this will help uh, lower your anxiety and stress and uh, make you uh, have a positive outlook, outlook in, in life. So what can students do? I will just make a rundown. Recognize that their anxiety, they should recognize that their anxiety is normal. It's understandably, it's understandable that they feel normal at this time. All of us feel that way. They need to stay informed but monitor media intake. Uh, parents can assist in monitoring uh, their internet use. They also have to do self-care, nourish their body, mind, and soul. And then it would help once they start the, with their classes, set small daily goals. Do not try to do all their schoolwork in one day. So uh, at some point, we lose our motivation and this is normal. The important thing is after that, we just engage in activities that will help us uh, feel positively and go back to what we were doing. Remember, to to take short breaks. These short breaks in, in, at home can uh, include uh, taking, take, uh, going to the kitchen, taking their favorite uh, drink or snack, or getting something, a study material in their, in their room. Now, it's important for students to connect with their teachers if they have questions and concerns. They also need to find ways to express their feelings. No? Uh, in their spare time, they can talk to their friends, and engage in activities where they can release all those uh, pent up or negative feelings. Um, students, be kind to yourself. Remember that you are doing your best given the circumstances. And also be positive that uh, this too shall pass. Now, what can schools do? Create a healthy and safe living spaces for our students, faculty, and staff. Provide psychosocial support for students, faculty, and staff who may need it. Uh, our Hope Community Counseling Center in SSC, we have provided uh, online, free online uh, counseling to our, not only for the scholastic and community, but for the public. Uh, also, um, our Benedictine sisters had been tirelessly praying with and for us. You know, every day they pray with us. And this has helped us a lot and has um, increased our sense of community. So it will help if the schools would uh, provide activities to foster uh, connectedness among its employees, uh, school community members. Um, share information to parents on how to reduce their children's stress and anxiety. Schools can include in their webinars 
on uh, on how to help also parents manage their own stress. And I think it can also help if at this early at this time you can include an IT expert in your webinars to answer their answer their questions about uh, gadgets and uh, technology that they would need uh, for their children uh, for online learning. Remind school staff of the importance of creating a calm and supportive environment for students. It's important that we are models of calmness and positivity for our students. You know, life is hard, life is difficult now, but it starts from all of us. We need to um, project that image that we are trying our best and uh, we are still blessed in spite of what is happening. Work with school health workers and guidance counselors to identify and support students who exhibit signs of, uh, of distress. Help faculty create new modalities of learning and provide them with needed learning uh, training and tools for online delivery of lessons. So COVID-19 pandemic continues to affect us significantly, but this may be also teaching us lessons that we can use to improve our lives. Hopefully, teenagers will grow up to be well-mannered with a unique appreciation for the value of connection compassion, kindness. We have shown a lot of this during the pandemic and hopefully they will do uh, imitate those, those values that we have uh, demonstrated and hopefully they will have less value on material things. COVID-19 pandemic will continue to present challenges beyond those that come up in the course of routine virtual education. The world is changing. We need to teach our students life skills by integrating them in our lessons. The skills that employers will look for candidates will be different. And these are adaptability, resilience, greed, and leadership skills no? to, to help come up with appropriate solutions or lead us in, in come up, coming up with proper solutions for the many problems our nation is facing now. So uh, let's be positive, knowing that there will be better days ahead. This is the end of my, my presentation. That in all things, God may be glorified. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Trinidad, for that uh, very comprehensive, clear, and enlightening presentation. It is really critical, especially at this time, that we as learning partners of our students are mindful of their emotional and mental well-being. Now, we shall proceed to the question and answer portion. Um, do we have questions from the participants? I guess it's because the presentation was very clear. Ms. Madel, um, yes, Madel. Yes, Pa. Yeah, uh, there's one there in the Q&A box. So it I, says here, good morning. Yeah. Yeah. Would you the like topic, to read? Oh. Yes, po. it's from Christina Price from St. Paul University, Quezon City. It says here, good morning. The topic is very interesting. May we be provided with a copy of the presentation. Thank you very much. This presentation is, very, is uh, being recorded and... Um, we will do our best to provide you with a copy of the presentation. Yes, Father Nolan. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. I would like to call the attention and make an appeal to all the guidance people in every school. If they can be very visible in social media and trying to take good care of their students. If a platform can be used, in every, if every Catholic school has been a platform to connect with their students. It's a, great, it's a great help. A lot of young people nowadays would not be, be able to understand what they're going through, what their parents might be going through. Kasi baka sa bahay, stress na yung magulang, ginagawa ng magulang, yung stress na pinapasin niya sa kanya anak. And, and, and we, have to, we really have to address, especially young people may, may not be that mature enough to understand what they're going through. So I'm calling all the, I'm appealing to all the guidance people in every Catholic school, I hope your presence really is felt and seen by our students. You're able to connect. The word now is really connect. Connectivity. Connect with your students so that you'll be able to, to help them go through this pandemic. So thank you for that presentation. 
Okay, thank you to Dr. Nolan, uh, Father Nolan. Uh, do we have any other questions from the participants? Okay, if none, then again, thank you, Dr. Trinidad, for sharing your time with us. I will now hand you over to Dr. Fornest for the awarding of certificate. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Trinidad and Ms. Negradas. Okay, so um, okay, so we would like to award. <laughs> Of course, no, uh, no, we will not witness the actual awarding, no? but uh, we would like to um, present this certificate of appreciation from uh, the CAP and CR and Rex. So allow me to read this, the citation. The Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, NCR, in partnership with Rex Bookstore, presents the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Maria Victoria Trinidad, for sharing her valuable contribution as resource speaker on safeguarding mental wellness of students under the new normal during the CAP NCR Tertiary Schools webinar with the theme CAP NCR Tertiary Schools geared towards a holistic approach to preparing for the new normal held on July 8, 2020, signed by yours truly and our Vice Regional Trustee, uh, Sister M. Christine L. Pinto, Order of St. Benedict, and our Regional Trustee of CAP and CR, Father Nolan A. Hue, PhD. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Trinidad, for that um, valuable input that you have given us. So at this point, um, we would I would like to call on Dr. Erlinda Asierto, our vice chair, the vice chair of the tertiary committee to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Asherto, please. Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to introduce our learning partner Professor Leslie Ann Ruthal. Ms. Leanne, as is fondly called, is a theology teacher and a youth minister. She has been in youth ministry since she was 13 years old. She finished a bachelor's degree in nursing, cum laude, from Makati Medical Center. She worked as a nurse at the National Kidney and Transplant Institute for two years. Her participation in the World Youth Day in Madrid, Spain in 2011, affirmed that she was called to take the road less travel. She left the nursing profession and became a full-time missionary for Missionary of Families for Christ, formerly CFC FFL. To strengthen her knowledge and confidence for her ministry, she began pursuing a degree in Master in Religious Studies, major in Catechetics at Don Bosco School of Theology in Paranaque City, where she graduated as Manya Cum Laude. Leanne works, worked in the social media ministry of her charismatic organization. She also served as the social media coordinator of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines during the Year of the Lady. She served as a campus minister for St. Pedro Poveda College, where she provided the grade school department a pastoral program integrating Poveda values, Christian living, education, and campus ministry. After her master in religious studies in Don Bosco School of Theology, she further took up master of arts in theology with major in moral theology. She is currently writing her thesis. She began her journey in teaching theology in the college at De La Salle University. In 2018, she became a faculty member of the theology department of Ateneo de Manila University. While teaching theology in Ateneo de Manila, she also teaches grade 11 and seminarians in San Carlos Seminary 
and prayers and faith. In Don Bosco School of Theology, she also teaches under the pastoral ministry program, Theology of the Lady to Lay Sedition Brothers, and Christian Morality and Catechesis under the Evangelium Program for Catechesis. More than being in the academe, Leon is a youth ministry, youth minister, accompanying and monitoring young people in charismatic organizations in dioceses and parishes. She is now serving the young through the Salesian Youth Movement, head of the Salesian Youth Movement volunteers, where she helps in the formation of youth ministers, spiritual moderators, and youth directors. Beside their academic and ministry work, she likes to cook and bake during her free time and eventually put up Lian Kitchenette online. In two days, Lian will be celebrating her 33rd birthday. Dear educators, let us welcome our resource speaker and learning partner, Professor Lian Rosal. Hello, everyone. So that was quite a lengthy introduction. She did not mention it a while ago, but to keep things light, Miss uh, Dr. Asherto was my professor in Don Bosco Center of Studies, now Don Bosco School of Theology. So it, it is an honor to be able to um, have her here and also introduce me. Um, so let me share my screen first. So the topic given to me, the topic given to me is rekindling a committed life of faith in the midst of a pandemic through Catholic education. So I'd like to begin this discussion with, okay, the discussion points that I will be giving this morning. So first, Lee, I would like to discuss basic points on Christian education coming from Pope Francis, no? So um, I got this from two recent speeches that he gave, no? That was last 2018 and then quite recent during, the, during a gathering of um, the plenary for, or the Congregation for Catholic Education in the Vatican during February of 2020. So it's fairly recent. And then secondly, I would like to introduce to you something that I discovered also when I became an educator that's forming students in virtue towards a committed life of faith. And then lastly, I would share with you some best practices that I got from people who are already exercising point number two. Okay. I'd like to begin this one with something that Pope Francis said during his address noong June 25, 2018 to the members of the Gravissimum Educationist Foundation. So this foundation was um, organized in 2015 by Pope Francis himself. And he said something very, very beautiful. He said that it's only by changing education that we can change the world. Now, he said this during the year 2018. Na nakakatawa nga dahil in the year 2020, we were caught off guard that, you know, suddenly there is this COVID pandemic. And then all of a sudden, you know, bilang educator, as educators and teachers, if there are deans here, administrators of schools, no? All of us were caught by surprise because we suddenly had to change gears in education. So if before, the Catholic Church has always issued this clarion call of new evangelization to explore new arenas and many ways in proclaiming the gospel, now we have this concrete reality wherein instead of a physical classroom, we are now making use of these um, technologies such as learning management systems, you know, such as 
using your computers, using your cell phone. Um, some teachers would even use uh, applications such as Perusal, Canvas. No, if you're if you're having uh, trainings in your respective schools already, you would be familiar with the terms that I've been mentioning. No? So all of a sudden, we have this new landscape. And even in the arena of education, we are, we are, that's why we are having this webinar because lahat po tayo talaga nangangapa. Just to share a bit, when this began, I was in the middle of teaching at the Ateneo, third year students on marriage, sexuality, and vocation, no? And I, the semester was cut short. So I was just with my students for a month. And then all of a sudden, there was, an, there was a guideline that we had to migrate online. And, and even if I had a background already with using learning management systems, I also probably, no, kayo din, I also felt that initial anxiety of not knowing what to do. But, you know, through trainings, through self-care, through prayers, through introspection, Inspection because during the lockdown we spent most of our time at home, no. So, sa lahat po nang nangyari in the past few months, I think what Pope Francis said last 2018 was really prophetic. Only by changing education can be served. I hope you saw the many things that are happening in government in the world today. If you are active in social media, I'm active in Twitter and Facebook. Now, especially when you go on Twitter, it's a social media platform wherein views are being exchanged by the second. No? And most of the young people, if you want to know their insights, if you want to know what they think about you as a teacher, if they want, you want to know what they think about the world, you find that on Twitter. And... Well, and daming hindi magandang nangyayari sa mundo ngayon. And I think it, it is now in our hands as teachers na sa kamay na po natin bilang mga guro, meron po tayong kapabilidad na baguhin po ang mundo sa ngayon. Bakit po? Dahil sa panahon ngayon, yung mga bata, hindi naman sila pwedeng lumabas eh. Hindi sila papayagan ng magulang nila, hindi, hindi din kasama sa guidelines na pwede pa silang lumabas. And in the next few months, we will be restarting this, we'll starting the school year in a new landscape, which is the digital landscape. Now, how we will have good and upright citizens how we would have virtuous Christians and even non-Christians under our care, I would like to make this proposition that ang pagbabago sa panahon po ngayon, maaari pong magsimula ito sa ating mga guru. That's why I would like to propose at the beginning of this um, of this session already, I will already um, begin with the end in mind, that even if you are a teacher of science, even if you're a teacher of mathematics, even if you're not a Christian living education teacher or a teacher of theology, you can use your subject in order to form virtuous citizens or virtuous students. Okay? So what did Pope Francis say during his address to the participants of the plenary assembly of the Congregation for Catholic Education, what I told you a while ago. This is what he said, no? Education is a dynamic reality and it's a movement that brings people to the light. It's something that education is the pathway, one of the pathways by which we can make people grow, no? how we can make our students grow and develop into persons that are in our language today, in the millennial language today, woke people, or pag sinabing woke, open to the realities of their time, and not, open, not only open to the realities of their time, but 
they respond to these realities in solidarity, in communion, and towards the common good, no? Um, bakit ko, bakit po ako nag agree dito? Because it was through theolo- the- the- my education in theology that I think I became a better person. Um, kung, naki- kung narinig niyo po yung introduction sa akin kanina, parang aksidenta lang yung pagiging guho ko eh, no? I started with nursing. So, dahil pinilit ng magulang, I became a nurse. And then, there was just this invitation to sit down in Don Bosco School of Theology. And one Saturday, while I was sitting in the first class just to test the water, no, I completely fell in love with the study of theology. And even if in my mind I wanted to shift careers and become a psychologist, no, like Dr. Virginia, um, suddenly, you know, I became an educator. And I think that is my ultimate calling in life. It brought me up to an understanding of who I was. Because when I was studying theology, there were teachers, um, the Salesian educators, the priests who were um, teaching us in Don Bosco School of Theology. They weren't only communicating knowledge to us, but they were integrating what we may know about God into particular life skills. And so I remember it was a time of discovery of who I was. It was a time of a deeper relationship with God. Up until it came to a point when I realized whatever change happened to me was also something that I wanted to share to others. Hence, I became an educator. Now, Pope Francis gives us four traits of Christian education in his speech last February. He says that in Christian education, you find four movements. So firstly, you have the ecological movement. Secondly, the inclusive movement. Thirdly, the peacemaking movement. And then fourthly, the team movement. So I would go through each movement. And then as I go through each movement, what I'd like you to do is that as, as you read and as I also explain what the movements are about, no? I would also like you to think of who am I as an educator? Am I, in a way, applying whatever suggestions Pope Francis is giving me? No? So, simulan po natin sa ecological movement. Now, what is that trait of Christian education or that, that, that movement called ecological movement? According to Pope Francis, he says that education should place the person and his her, her potential at its center. Now, all these things that I'm mentioning are actually basics. You may know this already. But in a time of great anxiety during this pandemic, it's good to go back to the basics, no? Because they're very foundational. And then coming from that, maybe um, from the foundational principles, we could already do creative um, and innovative strategies on how we would teach as educators and how we would be as educators. And so the ecological movement states that the student is at the center of education. Kapag ikaw ba ay teacher, ano ba ang goal mo sa pagtuturo ng isang lesson? Ang goal mo ba sa pagtuturo ng isang lesson ay Okay, sige. Kailangan ko lang mairaos to kasi nga pagod na ako. No? And that could happen during this entire time of um, us doing things online. No? I- I'm, I'm, currently, I'm currently doing a refresher course at the Ateneo at the moment. Um, and it's really different from face-to-face teaching. And sometimes it could be very draining. Lalong-lalo na kapag nagtuho ka ng mga estudyante in Zoom sessions, no? Um, madalas kasi baka mamaya dumating tayo sa point na san, baka ma- mairaos na lang natin to. Pero a good educator would always think of the welfare of his or her student. Hindi lang basta-basta na maituho ko tong subject na to. Pero ang isang mabuting guro ay iisipin Ito bang tinutuho ko ay nakakapagpabago 
ng pananaw ng estudyante ko? Ito bang itinutugo ko kahit mathematics ito, pag-solve ng formula, does it communicate a competence in order for me to form my student, not only adept in or good in making mathematical equations, but the student will be able to see the value or the virtue behind me teaching this way. No? Each time that we teach our student, we need to see that we need to bring the student into an introspection, into his or her inner self. No? Um, kailangan hindi lang siya yung basta, kailangan kong ituro tong lesson na to eh. Pero kailangan lumago ang aking estudyante. My student should be able to grow. My, able, the, my student should be able to acquire life skills that whatever this subject or whatever this lesson in mathematics or space and point in social sciences, um, whatever this topic I'm discussing, would, would be something that they will apply in real life. No? So, bilang, bilang educator, dapat meron din tayong um, effort also to bring and lead our students into a deeper reflection of the lessons that we are teaching. No? Now, Pope Francis also mentions that not only to a deep knowledge of oneself, but of the common home in which the person lives, and above all, of the discovery of fraternity as a relationship that produces the multicultural composition of humanity as a source of mutual enrichment. So in other words, as an educator, I should be able to teach my students to know themselves better, to be at peace with themselves, to also be at peace with others, to establish harmony with nature, and also to establish harmony and solidarity with others. Of course, to also establish communion, harmony, spiritually with God. A point of reflection, am I an educator capable of developing an ethics of ecology? Am I an educator capable of um, teaching my students that there is a need to help people to reach out, especially to the marginalized and especially those who are oppressed? Um, am I an educator capable of, through effective pedagogy, to grow in solidarity, teach my students to grow in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care. No? And also, that also would apply to ourselves. Um, am I a person growing in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care? Am I, a, am an, am I an educator who is compassionate? The second movement mentioned by Pope Francis is the inclusive movement. And you would um, note that of, of during the entire papacy of Pope Francis, this is one of his favorite themes, no? inclusion. Now, what is the inclusive movement? Pope Francis says that it's an inclusion that reaches out to those who are the least, the last, and the lost. No? It's an inclusion that, and he mentions this, and gives, gives a stress, especially in favor of refugees, of victims of human trafficking, of migrants, without distinction on the basis of sex, religion, or ethnicity. Now, looking at this trait of Catholic education, I now look at myself as a teacher. Am I a teacher or an educator who will accelerate this inclusive movement of education to counter what you call now a throwaway culture? which originates from the denial of fraternity as a constitutive element of humanity. Ano po ba yung throwaway culture? Yung throwaway culture is a culture po of disposables. And you would find now that no, halos lahat ng gamit natin ay may mga, maraming mga gamit natin ay disposable na. So, um, kapag kakain ka sa fast food, no, uh, merong mga disposable spoons, disposable fork, no? Tapos, pagkatapos ng isang gamit, tatapon mo na. Now, this throwaway culture could also be applied to human beings wherein 
um, we have a culture at the moment that instead of looking at the human person as someone that I should love, or yung kapwa ako, is that someone that I should love, I treat that person in a very utilitarian way, meaning I use this person. I look at this person as a something instead of a somebody, someone who is also given the same breath of God when he or she was created, the same way as me. No? And so, magami po din tayong mga estudyante na maaaring nagkakaroon ng difficulty kapag um, ina-access ang ating mga online resources. Sa August, kapag nagsimula tayo, baka maka-encounter din tayo ng mga estudyante na hirap sa bagong digital landscape. I think this inclusive movement ap would aptly apply to what us being teachers and looking at our students in a very inclusive and compassionate manner. Pwede nga nating tingnan, no? Ang ating mga lessons ba? Ang ating mga itinutuho ba? ay um, lessons na alam kong ma-access ng lahat ng estudyante ko. As part of our training at the Ateneo, I'd just like to share because I learned a lot from our trainings. Um, the current framework that uh, we are trying to uh, adapt in this new normal is called adaptive learning. And so, medyo madugo siya on the part of the educator. Kasi nga, if we would like to post a video for our students to watch, I need to also think of my students who might not be able to access that video. And so, kahit na mahirap, noong una narinig ko to, sabi ni Father Johnny Go, ah, as part of adaptive learning, you need to transcribe the video. And the video should only be at around 5 minutes, no? or to 5 to 10 minutes. And so, I was telling my colleagues at the beginning, I find it hard to, I find it hard as a direct, as, as a suggestion rather, that I would transcribe the videos that I would show my students. But when I was reflecting upon it, parang naisip ko, kaya nga ako nagguro. Kasi ang pagiging guro ay isang bukasyon, isang tawag ng Diyos na ang sentro ng aking pagtuturo ay ang aking mga estudyante. At kailangan kong tingnan, ano ba ang ikabubuti ng estudyante ko? More than sa ikabubuti ko. Kasi let's face it, bilang educators naman, we are not in pedestals. Eh. Madalas tayo, mahihikap talaga maging educator when you have to do assessments, when you have to craft your lessons. Mahihikap din na mak makisalamuha sa mga estudyante sa classroom, lalong lalo na kapag marami silang tanong. Pero naisip ko, bilang educator, dapat yata, natingnan ko yung kung ano yung kapanganan ng estudyante ko. And so, now at the moment, what I'm doing as a preparation for August, I'm trying to transcribe the videos that I will also be showing my students. And I, I always think, Lord, this is a labor of love. Why? Bilang educator, kailangan mahal ko yung mga estudyante ko. Ano bang ikabubuti ng mga estudyante ko? Next, it, the peacemaking movement. You know what is um, the state of Christian education? The peace building peacemaking, educational movement is a force to be nurtured to counter the egoism that generates non-peace rift between generations, between peoples, between cultures, between the rich and poor populations, between men and women, economy and ethics, and between humanity and the environment. I would like to um, bring you into another reflection. Am I an educator that fosters shalom? Now, what is a shalom? Now, shalom is the Hebrew word you know, for peace. It's synonymous to peace. But in the Hebrew understanding of shalom, it's much deeper. Shalom is God reconciling all things to himself through Christ. Shalom, you have a sense of wholeness. You have a sense of completion. Um, I would like to look at shalom in the sense of communion, no? So, shalom is being in communion with God, being at peace with myself as an educator and as a person, and being in communion with others. Am I a teacher who is in communion with God? Am I a Christian educator who is at peace with 
myself. No? This, ang sabi nga in the Hebrew understanding of shalom, when you go to the script, when you go to scripture, um, when you say you are at peace with yourself, inner peace is not the absence of, ano eh, the absence of difficulties. Eh. Peace is not the absence of war. But being at peace, when you are at peace, because God is within you, despite the anxieties of today, despite the things that may um, bog you down as a person, you know that God is a faithful God and that God would always be with us, that God has already walked, you know, He walked with us already and He continues to be with us. And so, I know and I believe and I have faith that this God will not leave me. It now makes me, it now gives me this sense of peace that I can move forward because this God fills me with hope. And of course, lastly, shalom. When I am at peace with God and when I am at peace with myself, naturally, I will also be at peace with others. Not only with my neighbor, with the entire, um, with other created realities. Now, lastly, it's a team movement, no? So, um, the Vatican document, Gravissimum Educationist, affirms that the school establishes, as it were, a center whose work and progress must be shared together by families, by teachers, by associations, and various types that foster cultural, civic, and religious life, as well as by civil society and the entire human community. So, in a way, um, this is the, what you call the spirit of collaboration. Um, a while ago, in the previous talk that you heard, that you would, um, you would find that um, in dealing with our students with mental health issues, and also in taking care of the mental health of our students, it has its students. It has to be a collaborative work with the parents and the teachers and the institutions. No? Actually nga, gusto kong dagdagan ito na hindi lang sa studente, pero it's also between the institution and the teacher. Kasi mahihirapan ang teacher na ito, magturo, ang, mag, magturo sa estudyante kapag ang teacher ang may mental health issue, no? O kapag ang teacher ang may high anxiety. And I'm not sure how many of you present here at the moment are feeling very anxious of the new setup, no? And so, um, the institution must also be able to provide no, um, mental health care to, its, to the teachers and to its employees so that they can be effective and also reaching out to the students. Um, that's an example of the team movement. Now, what does Pope Francis further say? He further says that Catholic University pursues its objectives through its formation of an authentic human community animated by the spirit of Christ. And so, how does this happen? It should be a community of study, research, and formation. Um, in teaching theology at the moment, especially to students who might be very allergic to theology, especially that my subject um, tackles very, very, very difficult issues on human sexuality, on marriage, and um, it's a touchy topic for students and Ateneans. Um, and also when I was teaching this in La Salle, and when I also conversed with many young people um, as a youth minister, mahirap yung um, issues on morality. Ang, ako personally, ang hirap niyang ituro. But what I learned is that I should not take all the weight upon myself eh. Um, maybe in order for my students to understand why the church thinks this way about marriage, maybe I need to look at the psychological aspect of love and relationships. And so in my classes, uh, I have always been integrating the guidance office in my teaching of theology. So last semester, naalala ko, there was one, there was one grand class that I organized with the guidance office and they discussed the psychological um, dimension of love. No? So in the discussion of the psychological dimension of love, um, it was after that discussion of the psychological dimension of love, it was already easy for me to 
to relate it to what is divine love, no? So, that's an example of a team movement. Um, in teaching your course, it could be a collaboration of disciplines. So, hindi siya, maganda, maganda na makikita yung, yung teamwork or yung community work, no? especially ngayon in the time of pandemic. Um, to lessen your anxiety, maybe you could, for example, if you're teaching re religious education or theology like me, you could connect with the guidance office no? to give you a psychological perspective on, on what you're discussing. And then, um, you could also, ako ginagawa ko, I also collaborate with um, one colleague, one example, one colleague who's teaching about um, human sexuality he would invite his wife, who's a biochemist, in his class. No? And, and his wife will teach the class about um, what, what hormones are working within the person who's in love, etc., etc. So that's, that, that, that's an example of team movement. Now, a point of reflection. Are we educators who will reinvent the village of education? So, the call of Pope Francis in February 2020 is that we all reinvent the village of education. And I think what we're doing at the moment is already one of the, um, one of the ways by which we reinvent this village of education. We need to find a common step to revive the commitment for and with the younger generations, renewing the passion for a more open and inclusive education capable of patient listening constructive dialogue, and mutual understanding. And so the lessons that we should be able to craft, the lessons that we should teach, must be revolutionary. It should be capable of changing the world. No? So here... Pope Francis, um, in another document or in another speech, now gives us ways on or um, ways on how we could make creative and innovative projects in our educational institutions. So maybe we could also reflect if we have these three qualities. No? Firstly, he says that the first the first um, criterion is identity. And so, what is identity? Are we, what, uh, what, am, what I am teaching, is it consistent with the vision and the mission of the school? No? Because maganda sana na yung lahat ng mga tinuturo sa studyante as part of um, a university or a school, lahat ng tinuturo dapat in a way, kung ikaw ay guro, pag gumagawa ka ng lesson plan or gumagawa ka ng, um, in a way, uh, syllabus, dapat iniisip mo din, is this consistent with what the university, with the university identity or the school's identity? So, these, the values of the school are, and the Christian values are essential for following the way marked out by Christian civilization and by the church's mission of evangelization. Now, case in point, in our university at the Ateneo, the vision is to form men and women for others. So when I teach marriage and human sexuality, I should not only focus on marriage and the family, but I should be also able, I should also be able to bridge that you know, that, 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 that lesson into a solidarity with a greater community. Kaya nga, the, whenever I end my subject, I always end with Christian discipleship. Eh. I begin with an understanding of the human person and the self. And then, eventually, we go into a relationship with another person, and then marriage. And then, we end with the relationship with the larger community. Dahil, ang bawat tao ay dapat may pakialam sa kapwa niya tao. And I, I remember crafting my lessons because I had in mind that I need to always inculcate in my students the vision of the university. 
that they should be men and women for others, that they should be magic, no? that they would always choose the loving option, the most or the more loving option. Second would be quality. So what is quality? This is the sure beacon that must shed, that must shed light on every enterprise of study, research, and education. So um, the lessons that we need to craft, the, um, the things that we need to teach, the suggestion is of Pope Francis is that it should be interdisciplinary. No? Um, if you're teaching religious education and theology, Ang hirap-hirap dalhin ang mga estudyante into the mysteries of faith. Pero kapag simulan, sinimulan mo siya in a very philosophical and psychological level, and then eventually, you go into the divine mysteries and dialogue with the divine mysteries. You know, they find it really, really... Um, they, find, they, they find the connections um, driving them towards knowing the faith more. Kaya nga, I, I always tell people when they ask me, so how do you teach your subject of morality? Well, at the beginning, when I teach about, for example, marriage and human sexuality, um, I always begin with who they are, their identity as a human person, their identity um, bilang anak ng Diyos. Pero bago po banggitin si God, kailangan po munang i-establish yung kung sino sila bilang tao. Kaya nga, I, I would always, I would always at the beginning, so mga first four meetings, I would try my best not to mention the faith and God. So I would be discussing psychology, philosophy, and then eventually I would lead them to a, lead them to a dialogue of those two disciplines with the faith. And then they say, oh, so it makes sense pala. So what we are believing is actually very human, no? And, you know, when, when that happens, you make the learning experience richer. Now, lastly, lastly, we need to see um, are the projects in that the school is doing, or the projects the school are doing, and what I'm doing is the goal, the common good. Um, because yung nga nangyayari sa atin ngayon, lagi ko, nga, lagi ko nga pong sinasabi sa mga tao kapag nagsasalita ako sa mga educators, nagsasalita ako sa mga youth ministers, sa mga youth directors, sa totoo lang, ang pinaka-problema ng society natin ngayon is, syempre, bibilangan mo lahat yan, poverty, inequality, um, corruption in the government. Alam nyo lahat po yan nagsisimula na tamang-tama ang compendium of the social doctrine of the church in its introduction in paragraph 16. Ang sabi doon, Ang pinaka-problema natin ngayon ay nakakalimutan na ng tao kung sino siya bilang tao. Kaya kapag nakalimutan ng tao kung sino siya bilang tao, ang hirap-hirap magpakatao. Kasi hindi niya nakikita na ang kapwa niya ay tao din. Kaya ang hirap mag-work for the common good. What is common also, because I, I need to understand that me as a human person, I share a common humanity with my neighbor. And if I lose a sense of who I am and my the dignity that I carry as a person and the dignity that my neighbor is carrying, we won't arrive at the common good. And so maybe, you know, even if our subject is not religious education, maybe we need to also look at that. Am I bringing my students towards an understanding that we all need to work for the common good? Because in the Vatican document for religious education, the goal of education is that we all build the kingdom of God. No? Ikaw bilang tao, your goal is to also build the kingdom of God. Education now, religious education is a way to be able to bring people into the reality that they need to build the kingdom of God on earth. And in building the kingdom of God on earth, that would happen if we have this idea of the common good, that we all belong to one family. If we all think of it that way, edi walang poverty, no? walang human trafficking, walang um, hashtag iha ako or the rape culture, um, rape culture, what do you call this, um, scenario that is happening in social media na naglalabas na yung mga stories of students that they were molested by their teachers or they were, they were raped by their friends, etc. Now, 
with, with, with all these, this is something that I'd like to propose. Um, I gave a talk on this already in a webinar months ago, but I'd like to um, also share it with you. What I'd like to propose is that as we teach our students, maybe we don't only need, we, we don't only go into to, um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, you know? Pero putting them together, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, or the learning competencies that I, um, I have in mind when I craft my lessons, when I want to teach my students, maybe all in all, I need to, maybe we need to see that if there's an imperative now to form students of virtue or form people of virtue, okay? Now, Pope Francis says that becoming a saint is that we become fully ourselves, becoming what the Lord wished to dream for us, what is, that we follow His will, follow God's will, and to carve our own path because we are not photocopies of other people. So, ano po ba ang goal ng Christian life? Ano ba ang goal mo bilang Kristiyano? The goal is, at the end of the day, that we all become saints. No? I remember... Um, when I was in La Salle, one of the favorite quotations, um, although not verbatim, quotations that I, that I know of um, John Baptist de La Salle is that you need to always think that as an educator, you need to lead your students to heaven. So that's one of your goals, no? Because if you want them to live a committed Christian life, that would now be equal to your student be informed in the way of holiness towards sainthood. And so, what I'd like to propose is that, you know, we teach them to be people of virtue. Now, what is virtue? Virtue is a good habit. It's something that a person possesses na hindi lang, hindi lang one-time, big-time thing that, for example, if I, if I want to be patient, I will only be patient one time. But it's something that has to be practiced. It's something, has to, it's, it's something that has to grow in you until patience becomes you. Until people see you as a walking, um, as a walking embodiment of patience. And so how can we obtain virtues, no? So we can obtain virtues or good habits can be obtained through repeated actions. And so, if we want to form our students, no, we should also um, be able to lead them in or na kapag, kapag kunyari, gusto mong maging mabuting tao, hindi ka lang magiging mabuting tao sa iisang decision. Pero ito ay dapat lumalago sa'yo araw-araw. Dapat pinapractice mo din siya. In moral theology, it, as it is used in moral theology, it is used um, to apply to persons with reason and will. And so it includes not only consistent internal actions, but corresponding intentionality. And so, for example, if you want to inculcate a virtue in our student by, for example, a lesson that we're teaching about say, human dignity, no? um, kailangan dumating ako sa punto na hihimukin ko ang aking mga studyante na hindi ko lang to gagawin na ipapractice isang, isang beses lang. ba usually may ganun tayo, okay, activity or point of reflection, what can I do this week in order, in order to, to look at the other person as dignified? Baka dapat hindi lang ganun. Baka dapat, it should be, um, we, it should be that we teach our students that it's not only a one-time, big-time thing that this week that we need to do. It's something that you need to do day after day until, you know, it becomes part of who you are already. Now, a habit is, in Latin, its meaning is captured into two terms, disposition and inclination. So if we want to, to form virtuous students, whenever we think of what application, no, yung pwede nating ibigay sa kanila sa mga lessons natin, baka dapat higher level na yung, parang we, we, we look at it, not, on a higher, parang a higher, we, we put a higher level goal in the lessons that we do, na? Um, 
Why? Because when you want to form vir a virtue in an individual, it has to even dig deeper. Dapat maging disposition siya ng tao. Habits are the more enduring qualities that make you a certain sort of person. Example, being patient, be becoming prudent, becoming obedient, no? Now, I'll give you an example, okay? In a game of tennis, sabihin natin there would, there's a competition between a good player and a bad player, no? Now, what would the bad player of tennis, um, what, 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 what will you, what, ano yung pwedeng maisip nyo na gagawin ng bad player of tennis? So, syempre, matatalo siya dahil magkakaroon siya ng constant misses as he hits the ball. But the good player, you know that the good player will win the game because the good player will reliably make good shots even when there are misses. Because the good player was trained in the game. Meron siyang training in the game. At hindi lang yun. In a way, na-acquire na niya yung knowledge, skills, and attitude of playing the game. Kaya kahit na, you know, may isang mintis, baka mamaya, isa lang yun or dalawa. But the rest of the game, ipapanalo niya. And so, why is being a good player in life more important than just simply doing good things? Now, we need to teach our students the value of reliability. Now, if we want to form students of virtue, people of virtue, citizens of virtue, um, people of virtue, Christians um, who are virtuous, then they should do good things frequently and consistently. Okay? So, having a virtue is not simply an indicator of fast action. But most importantly, a dynamic disposition to act well in the future. So you will know that even outside the classroom or after your lesson, pagkatapos mong ituro yung lesson sa estudyante mo, you will know that this student will, you know, hindi lang niya maako, hindi, hindi lang yung empty words yung lalabas sa reflection papers niya. Pero you would be assured as a teacher Na this student, even outside the classroom and beyond the classroom, and even pag graduate sa sila sa school, would be a good person, a virtuous person. When I was teaching in De La Salle, um, I was teaching about love. That was my first, and during my first year of teaching experience, I met a student who um, was constantly makulit. No, pero he was, he was very participative in the class discussions, no, and even wrote a letter to me after the class. Um, I remember, ang goal ko lang naman nun, because I was not really trained in education as most of you are. Ang, ang tanging dala ko lang ang puso. <laughs> puso at ang goal na kailangan maging mabuting tao at virtuous na tao ang mga estudyante ko. You know what is the thought? One of the touching moments that I that I would say um, I would always remember being an educator. Last year, he messaged me in Facebook. He's already in Japan, and he was telling me, "Hi, ma'am. I already have a girlfriend, and I'm applying our principles on love and chastity in our relationship." Now, this student, in the course of vocation and marriage in La Salle, also tried out entering the brotherhood, no? or the, 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 the brothers in La, uh, in La Salle. No? And then eventually, he found it was not for him, right? that he was for a married life. And so, nung ko naisip na, o nga, no, kapag ang goal mo ay higher, that you want your student to be holy, if you want to lead your students to heaven, then the effect of your lessons will be lasting. Now, we need now, more than ever, people of virtue. Sa panahon ngayon na ang daming nangyayari hindi maganda, kailangan natin i-form ang mga tao ngayon na merong hindi lang mabuti, pero kailangan virtuous. People who do not only do the right thing, but does so, or do so rather, for the right reasons. Now, virtue, in teaching them virtue, what must not be forgotten is that one's habits reveal not only what act 
tasks one frequently performs, but how, how one sees things and why one does those acts. No? So, kapag virtue ang goal mo sa, pag, sa pag-form sa estudyante mo, then you are forming not only, hindi, hindi mo lang dinidirect kung yung mga mabuting acts na pwede niyang gawin, pero yung buong pagkatao na niya ang target mo. And so to end, no? Um, in Gaudate et Exultate, Pope Francis says that holiness or the way to sainthood, no? the goal of the Christian life, which is to be a saint, is that it all begins with small gestures. It begins with um, kahit na hirap na hirap na hirap na akong mahalin yung nanay ko, tatay ko, kapwa ko ay patuloy kong susubukan na mahalin itong tao ko. Kahit na paulit-ulit niya akong ginagawa ng masama, paulit-ulit din ako magpapatawad. Dahil dadating pala ang punto na kapag paulit-ulit ko siyang ginawa, hindi na ganun kahirap dahil naging isang tao na akong mapagpatawad. No? Naging isang tao na ako na mahabagin. Whenever I recall this line in Gaudate et Exultate in my prayer time or whenever it comes to mind, uh, the quote of Mother Teresa about love also um, comes to mind. Love until it hurts, until it hurts, until it hurts no more. Noong una naisip ko, ay, mawawala na lang yung hurt kapag nagmahal ka. Eh, di ba, pag nagmamahal ka, constantly masakit? Pero hindi eh. As you constantly love and give love to someone, even if it's hard, it comes to a point wherein kahit na hirap na hirap ka, kahit na masakit na, at kahit na gusto mo nang isumpa yung taong yun, at isumpa yung taong yun, nadating ka sa punto na, hindi eh wala na akong magawa dahil alam ko ang nararapat. Dahil alam kong nagpapabuti at nagbibigay sa akin ng tunay na ligaya. Kaya magbahal. Kaya wala akong ibang gagawin. Hindi magmamahal lang ako. No? Kaya nga, um, naalala ko may, may nagsabi sa akin na tao na, bakit mo ba kailangan ihatid yung kapatid mo? So aside from being an educator, wanting sharing, um, I all, like you, I also have responsibilities in the home. And a while ago, I was very, very, very tired because I I bring my brother back and forth to office in Makati because he's a frontliner, he's a medtech. And his shifts are very different. So I also had to wrap around my, wrap around um, in my head na yung schedule ng kapatid ko ay dapat i-consider ko sa schedule ko. And someone told me na ang hirap naman magmahal. Sabi ko, oo, mahirap. Nakakapagod. Pero sa totoo lang, parang naging parte na siya ng everyday routine. Eh. Kasi ganun pala ang pagmamahal. Ganun pala ang virtue. If, if, if you have that virtue already, not saying, I'm not saying that I've acquired charity, no? Or, or love as a virtue. Just sharing an example. Kapag ganun pala, no? hindi mo na iniinde, hindi mo na iniisip. Pagod ka physically. But at the end of the day, hindi siya punto ng reklamo. Hindi siya iniisip na inconvenience. Pero ginagawa mo siya dahil alam mo, minahal kang una. And so maybe my last point for educators is this. You cannot form students in virtue if you're not also formed in virtue. You cannot lead students to an understanding of God if you yourself, you don't have a relationship with God. You cannot lead your students to be good and upright citizens if you yourself, you are not constantly striving to be good and upright citizens. No? So, um, I think the clarion call, in order to build a world that is inclusive, a world that is imbued with shalom, a world that that is um, looking into the common good as a goal. If we want to have a better world, and we want to have a better life, and we want to have fullness of life, 
then we need to teach ourselves to have a disposition <clears throat> of virtue and to also similarly live virtuous lives. So um, I pray that in the new normal, even if it's hard, um, we would lead our students to a committed life of faith by first, you know, looking at ourselves as educators and looking at who we are, looking at our vocation in a new light that we need to lead our students to sainthood and that we need to change the world. And it rests in our hands at the moment. Sabi nga ni Pope Francis, this is not the time that we should live in fear, but this is the time that we need to be courageous and that we need to stand up for what is right so that as teachers, we can teach our students to build a world that is based on what is true, what is beautiful, and what is good. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Thank you, thank you very much, me, uh, Professor Leslie Ann, for your expertise and experiences as you talk about rekindling a committed life of faith in the midst of pandemic through Catholic education, as this could be one of the pathways for our holistic approach in preparing for the new normal education. For this moment, we have one posted question here for our question and answer portion. So uh, this is from Mom Emmy Valeriano. How can we minister and educate our students who strongly adhere to various ideologies, such as relativism and other beliefs that contradict Catholic teachings? Can you share one best practice on how to deal with this? I forgot to mention something about um, what, what, what is mentioned in the latest document by Pope Francis, which is Christus Vivit, on how to deal with the young today. No? Um, mahirap, mahirap kasi kapag pinag-uusapan yung mga maseselang mga issues, no? na very touchy sa mga kabataan ngayon, especially on human sexuality, no? and especially on what they think about love, what they think about morality. It's, it's very, very difficult because they are bombarded with many ideologies. What I do as an educator is that I slowly accompany them to what is true, good, and beautiful. So there are two words, to listen to them and to accompany them. So Pope Francis says in Christus Vivit, um, that's what we need to do with the young today. Uh, ang kabataan ngayon, alam niyo kung ano po yung pinaka-trait nila. Ayaw na ayaw nilang sinasabihan sila kung ano yung dapat nilang gawin. <laughs> no? And even in the Synod, when, when um, Father Deggs, who was part of the Synod, sharing to us, um, Father Deggs de Guzman, he was telling us na yung mga nagsasalita daw na mga youth na na-invited in the plenary, no? Or in, in, in the synod, we're constantly saying, give us voices to speak. Dahil kaya din namin magbago ng mundo. Na um, we could be agents of hope in the world. And we need your guidance. We don't need you to tell us what we need to do. Because we can think. And we can also have, we also have the um, the ability to to reflect on, on our actions. No? So, I think ganon. Kapag, kapag kunyari, ang hirap-hirap ng ituro yung subject, una-muna, makinig ka muna. Listen to their perspectives. No matter how hard it is to swallow, especially if you have a different point of view, you need to also listen to what they say. Because a lot of what they say is based on ex personal experience. Kapag sinabi ng bata na hindi na siya naniniwala sa kasal, kailangan bilang educator, meron kang malalim na pag-intindi at pakikinig. Kasi hindi ka nang makikinig sa tenga mo. Makikinig ka by looking beyond what he is saying or what she is saying. And, and you need to understand, marami mga estudyante ngayon ang may broken families. If, if, if makikinig ka ng maigi, no? and then you slowly accompany them towards the truth, then 
they would eventually uh, it's not it's not foolproof no pero eventually you you also um you also paano ba sway them to your side <laughs> kaya nga sabi ko nga may mga may tatanong bakit yan yung field of theology na pinili mo no <laughs> bakit yan yung field of theology kasi ang hirap magturo ng morality ang lagi ko na lang sinasabi kasi nga sa totoo lang mahirap naman magturo kung hindi mo pina-practice so kunyari kapag may negative na sinasabi yung bata meron siya meron gusto niya makipagdebate about faith matters sa iyo makinig ka muna no i suspend your biases first and then slowly lead them towards the truth it's also a matter of technique siguro last na lang last tip it's also a matter of technique that's why i was telling you a while ago about interdisciplinary um approaches because uh, ang hirap hirap ngayon magturo sa mga bata na hindi mo ipo-prove sa kanila kung saan nang galing ito matatalino na sila ngayon eh they they have a world wide web of information where they can google and and sometimes you know it could lead them to different ideologies but if you explain say the faith to them in such a manner that is very human na you dialogue with other disciplines they eventually come to an understanding na, ah, okay, so may basis pala yung pananampalataya ko. So it's also reasonable, no? And, yun na nga, I think it, the, the personhood of the educator also comes into, into four, no? Or in, into play in all these. Um, your students will be able to see if you're walking the talk. No? And if you're walking the talk, and you are, you are exercising what you're teaching, you know, you communicate that passion to teach the students. Mo. And then eventually, you know, there must be students who will come to you and say, Alam mo, ma'am, um, bumalik ako sa simbahan because of this lesson. Alam mo, ma'am, bumalik ako sa pagsisimba at I gave God another chance because of what we learned in class. And so, uh, minsan iniisip ko, ano, bang ta- ano ba yung mga tamang strategies? No? Pero at the end of the day, yun na, doon ako laging bumabalik. Ang hirap ituro ng isang bagay na hindi mo ginagawa. And so maybe that's also, that's why I'm also saying as educators if you want them to to lead a committed life of faith it has to also reflect in your life. Are you leading committed lives of faith? Because without words actions are very powerful and it shows. Okay. Uh, there's already a response from from Mom Emmy. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Accompaniment is the key in educating the young. Ma, Professor Rosal, do we still have one question here? So, what could be the best from anonymous attendees? What could be the best way to integrate values in our different subjects now that we are in the new normal? Okay. Um. I have a background on theology. So, kung values ang pag-uusapan, madali siya in my subject. Pero what if you're teaching something completely different? Say, um, you're teaching mathematics. Okay. Share ko tong experience ha, na, na when I was a kid. When I was in grade 4, I had a certain topic in math na hirap na hirap akong gawin. But my math teacher was very memorable. Because my math teacher did not only teach me the techniques, she was also telling me, Lian, you have to practice in math because if you persevere, then you will get the right answer. So, ako naman, oh sige, so what do I do? Um, she said, you can go to the library, I can give you worksheets, you can practice this at home. So, I was practicing that. It came to a point na I realized the value of perseverance kasi naging madali na sa akin yung lessons after that because sabi ko it 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 requires practice pala and personally it's something that i never forgot because even up to now na realize ko na kapag may gusto kang gawin kapag nagpersevere ka at naayon siya sa grace na sa, sa will ni god magagawa mo siya eh, no so in a way that math teacher did not only teach me how to solve the equations that math teacher taught me perseverance so Maybe when we plan our subjects here in the new normal, um, maybe when we think about our learning outcomes, we only don't look at what knowledge, skills, and attitudes I need to identify, that, so that so that and, and so that 
as I identify that, yun yung gagawin kong lesson, di ba? And yun yung gagawin kong assessment. Pero, baka dapat, um, and I got this from our training in Ateneo, maybe we need to look at it in a matter of competence, no? And a competence is knowledge, skills, and attitude combined. Ibig sabihin ng competence is that this lesson, the goal for this lesson, should be able to teach my students something that they could apply in real life. No? So, baka dapat ganun. Ganun yung ating pagtingin sa, sa, sa ating, tinu kung tinuturuan natin ng isang studyante at ang sentro ng ating pagtuturo ay ating studyante, kailangan natin isipin, kapag tinuturuan ko ba sila ng biochemistry, ano ba? <laughs> Naalala ko biochemistry nung nursing ako, sabi ko, bang magagawa nito sa buhay ko? Pero hindi ko nakalimutan yung biochemistry, especially yung lessons ko on phenols and doing the experiments. Kasi, it also, it, it taught me, ano, it taught me a certain competence that I am currently living out at the moment. So, I think that's, that's one of the things that you can consider um, when I craft my lessons. I think of my students. And when I think of my students, I have this general question. Is my student on the way to sainthood? Is my student on the way to being holy? Is my student on the way to becoming a person who understands oneself, on, who is in communion with God, and also in communion with others? So, if you think of it that way, creative and innovative ways in teaching will, will, will suddenly follow you. Now. And suddenly, you're thinking out of the box. Because you're not only looking at hitting KSA, but you're also hitting something that is lasting. You know? Case in point, in this lesson, in this lesson, diba? Sorry, yeah. Um, in this webinar, um, a life of virtue or forming virtuous individuals. Okay. There is one more question here, Professor. Maybe we can uh, just send you the question from Leilani Donis because we have a oh. running out of time, yeah? Uh, we have here, he's asking about the religious activities. So for Mom Leilani Donis, maybe we can just send question from, for Professor Rosal to answer you back about this question. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Fornes, I will now turn you over to Dr. Fornes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Fontanilla and Professor Rosal, thank you so much. So, uh, at this point, uh, we would like to we would like to uh, award the certificate. Okay. Our simple uh, uh, certificate of appreciation to uh, Professor Rosal. So allow me to read the citation. So ca the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines NCR in partnership with Rex Bookstore presents the certificate of appreciation to Leslie Ann Rosal for sharing her valuable contribution as resource speaker on rekindling a committed life of faith in the midst of pandemic through Catholic education during the CAPNCR tertiary schools webinar with the theme CAPNCR tertiary schools geared towards a holistic approach to preparing for the new normal held on July 8, 2020, signed by yours truly and Sister M. Kristen, Christine L. Pinto, Order of St. Benedict, the Vice Regional Trustee of CAPNCR, and of course, Father Nolan Kweke, um, the Regional Trustee of the CAPNCR. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rosal, um, for allowing us to learn from you. Okay, so to cap our webinar, let us listen with the ear of our hearts to Sister M. Christine L. Pinto, Order of St. Benedict, the Vice Regional Trustee of CAPNCR and President of St. Scholastica's College, Manila, for her closing remarks. Sister Christine. It's almost noon, so I would like to... Uh, greet you already a good noon. This is once again um, a very beautiful way to cap our two-day seminar, two-day webinar, um, wherein I suddenly realized really the, the mission of, of Catholic education, um, what makes us distinct, you know, 
uh, the kind of education that you give is distinct compared to other maybe other um, universities and colleges is that it is not just a matter of um, imparting content, uh, which has been very much emphasized yesterday that now it's not just a matter of content, but really it is how we are preparing our learners, our students, actually ourselves, all of us, the entire um, community, uh, the entire educational community, our staff, our, our faculty, our administrators, into discovering who we are really meant to be, you know? the, the mission that the Lord has for us, or the vocation that, that, we, that we have, that has been um, chosen for us for the future. And everything that we are supposed to learn in an educational institution is, is just a way of discovering all our gifts, all our talents, um, in, in um, gathering all our, our wisdom, equipping ourselves with, with skills in order for us to be true and authentic to, to the call um, of, of God for us no? in building the kingdom. And, and so clearly no, um, with, with our theme of um, uh, towards a holistic approach, uh, it is good that yesterday we started with, of course, our instruction, no, uh, technical in the sense that how are we going to do our, our um, mission as educators in terms of delivering instruction, in terms of using the, um, our other resources no, uh, to be able to align them with the reality of the pandemic. But now is the very reason, I think, why Yesterday, the, the focus was experiential learning, where the focus was being sensitive to the needs of our students, of our learners. Because basically, we are supposed to accompany them. And if we do not allow ourselves you know, to listen to their experiences, if we do not allow ourselves to um, be sensitive to their needs, then we would not be able to achieve that, that, that goal, that mission, that to accompany them in learning who they are, in discovering who they are, in, de in developing the gifts that they have, in order that they will move to be, or that they will grow to be authentic, authentic disciples of Christ. And yes, um, the challenge is greater because for all of us, uh, education has always been like confined to the classroom. You know, it, one has to go to the school. One has to be in campus. I was just thinking, how can we have a holistic formation, the spiritual formation, if we cannot have um, institutional masses, if we cannot have the retreats, you know, uh, if we cannot have our morning praises in campus. But now the challenge really is how to bring Christ no, no, Christ is already there, but how to make our students realize, you no, know, being confined in one house, being confined in, in one place. So it's really about making meaning of where they are at now, you know, where we are all at now. You know, even our faculty have to be confined also in their, in their uh, um, homes. homes you know, and, and therefore, it's making meaning of where we are, it's helping our students make meaning of their reality now, the experiences that they have, that education is not confined to the classroom. And learning more about oneself and learning more about Christ, who we are supposed to be following, can actually be, um, can actually happen you know, in the encounters, the personal encounters that happens to all of us wherever we may be. So I thank no um I thank our uh, resource speakers no um Dr. Trinidad of course was also uh, speaking about the importance of accompaniment actually no of, of counseling because they are now in a situation that there are more questions. Um 
the realities of our government, the realities of our life is magnified because of social media. It's more magnified because they're confined to one place and therefore uh, the accompaniment is very crucial. You know? uh, spiritual accompaniment in terms of also of, of counseling um, and, and I guess you know, just, just what uh, uh, Ian has mentioned, uh, the way Dr. Trinidad presented it, that it's not just, it has to be um, a collaboration in the school, the faculty, the students, no? um, the entire institution in allowing ourselves to accompany each other. No? And therefore, thank you. I would like to thank, of course, Dian uh, and, and Dr. Dr. Trinidad for our resource speakers today. And I would like to reiterate to one of our speakers yesterday, um, Dr. Fermin and Mr. Danshanko. Um, in behalf uh, of the SEAP NCR Tertiary Committee, you know, um, I would like to thank uh, Rex Group of Companies, Attorney Buhayin, thank you very much. Um, Joey Pineda, who has um, constantly been working with the committee to make this two-day webinar possible. And of course, the, the support of um, the officers and board of trustees of um, CAF NCR, headed by uh, Father Nolan. Um, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to be able to deliver this you know, um, to our educators, uh, to our member schools, not just to the HEIs, but also to our um, basic education institutions. And um, thank you, dear participants. Uh, of course, no matter how much we have prepared for this, if you are not around, then uh, we would not have been able to accomplish the goal to be able to reach out, you know, to be able to offer um, opportunities for all of us, for all of us to be, to be prepared uh, uh, to have more skills that we need uh, in order to be able to respond to the challenge of the pandemic. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to congratulate everyone. Uh, of course, not to forget, I would ask also to give thanks, to give our gratitude to our CAP NCR um, staff, uh, Chris, you know, Marty, uh, Kat, you know, uh, thank you very much for all the assistance and again, of course, for Rex because they provided the platform for us for this webinar to be able to uh, to be held. And so I, I wish you once again a, a good day and uh, blessings to all of us as we really prepare for um, our new school year and that it gives me much hope. It gives me much hope that... Um, we, you know, as, as educators, are once again, I would like to believe, refreshed. We are reminded. It's really the work of the, the Holy Spirit. We are reminded of what our Catholic education is really all about. And, and since yesterday, this has been um, shared already by our, um, our resource persons. And, and it gives me really much joy and much hope that we have had this opportunity to put everything together to give us a, a again, uh, to direct us, you know, to really what really matters in terms of our mission as um, Catholic uh, Christian educators. So uh, thank you, and I, I wish you um, the best of the remaining of the days, and really for, we continue to pray that everyone will be safe, um, that we continue to pray that um, everyone will be uh, safe from from the COVID disease and that more and more we see the efforts of our government to be able to help the entire, the entire country, the entire nation. So thank you and have a blessed day. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Christine. Uh, we really take the challenge of the new normal and uh, we continue to be authentic, authentic disciples of Christ being educators, school administrators, um, informing uh, the youth through education. 
So thank you very much once again. So uh, just to um, have some announcements for everyone. So uh, please accomplish the online evaluation uh, that will be sent via email. And also the e-certificate of participation will be sent through email as well. So there we have it. As we end uh, this two-day webinar, we bring back to God all the glory for bringing to completion this activity. And so we say, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Goodbye for now. And thank you very much once again for your participation. God bless us all.